Hello, and welcome to another rendition of AMWA After Hours. This evening, we will be exploring the art movement that captured the Midwest after the First World War, regionalism. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the chat and questions will be answered after the presentation during the Q&A. After the Armory Show in 1913, artists in America became inspired to emulate the modern art that Europeans were creating. However, this wasn't the case for all artists. Many American artists were interested in creating work that focused solely on the United States. These artists, like Thomas Hart Benton and John Stuart Curry, wanted to create work around the landscapes and people they knew best, the Midwest. After the end of World War I, the American population was interested in directing their attention inward on solely American experiences. An American Renaissance had begun to sprout rejecting European ideals and standards, focusing instead on the rise and growth of modern America. This idea was quickly ad adopted by many American artists, most notably by the American regionalists. Art historian Matthew Bale wrote, quote, in their search for a key to the perplexities facing virtually everyone, artists of the 1930s charted and documented the body of America as never before, end quote. The first few exhibitions that displayed regionalist work were initially referred to as the American wave. This was an all-encompassing term used to describe the feeling that had fallen upon the U.S. art world rather than to name a specific group of artists or genre of works. The term the American wave was coined by senior editor of the Art Digest, Peyton Boswell Sr., who described it as, quote, a movement looking forward to the production of works of art that avoiding foreign influences actually express the spirit of the land, end quote. As America focused inward, they were faced with the challenge of the Great Depression, which deeply impacted the life of all Americans, artists included. Many regionalists were unable to find work. It wasn't until the U.S. government began funding programs for artists that they were able to get back on their feet. Many are familiar with Roosevelt's New Deal and the different government aid programs that were created, including the Federal Arts Pro Project, or the FAP, in 1935. Before the FAP was created, the Public Works of Art Project, PWAP, was the first federally funded program that aided artists in December of 1933. The PWAP had a short-lived life, but set the foundation for what the FAP would become. The PWAP was very successful in getting artists back to work. In its six-month-long existence, about 3,750 artists created over 15,000 works of art and over 700 murals. The guiding theme for work to be created for PWAP commissions was American regionalism. Here, finally, was what was considered by critics to be a purely American art form that was removed from European standards, a step towards an American modern art. Artists like Thomas Hart Benton, Edward Hopper, and John Stuart Curry saw this as an opportunity to explore these ideas. Rather than deviate from genre and realism scenes as many European and other American artists were doing, Regionalists felt that these scenes instead best re represented the community, politics, history, and cha social changes happening in America at the time. Focused on shared experiences rather than the individual. Artists Charles Birchfield and Edward Hopper are considered to be the fathers of regionalism, which was portrayed by them as a drab appearance and a nostalgia for home. In 1926, Benton had matured in his style and his work shed a more positive light into the American scene. The New York Times edit editorial writer and author R.L. Duffus wrote of this shift in perspective as, quote, there can be no doubt that America, having expressed herself politically, mechanically, and administratively, is on the point of attempting to express herself as aesthetically. This has been thought before, but now one begins to believe it is true. End quote. It was in 1934 that the term regionalism was coined and recognized by critics, although Benton and Curry had already produced many of their most famous works before this time. 
It was large in part due to a Time Magazine article that was published that year. At the time, an art dealer, Maynard Walker, aimed to sell the paintings of Benton and Curry in the Midwest, but was unsuccessful. This grabbed the attention of Henry Luce, founder of Time Magazine, who was looking for a story to be featured in the issue's first full-colored story and felt that these artworks would make a great impression. The story was published on December 24, 1934, and featured Benton on the cover, with Benton, Curry, and Grant Wood written about as being leaders of a new movement known as regionalism. While they had largely been dismissed by New York critics, all three received recognition and fame essentially overnight, becoming recognizable American painter names. Art historian and fine art specialist Marion Berardi wrote of this article, quote, the Time Magazine essay argued that Americans needn't look to Europe any longer for artistic inspiration. All an artist ever needed was right here on American soil, end quote. These three artists, Benton, Wood, and Curry, were all familiar with each other's work and eventually formed relationships. Benton and Curry met in 1929. Benton would meet Wood five years later in 1934. All three artists had developed their own signature styles that varied drastically from one another, but portrayed similar subject matter. At the time, fascination of the Midwest was strong amongst many Americans during the 1920s and 30s. The Midwest was a region of great diversity industrially, geographically, and culturally, and regionalist art captured these ideas. Regionalism quickly became known as the art of rural America with apolitical contexts and a homesick attitude for the simple beginnings of the Midwest. The most visible and well-known artist of the regional movement would have to be Thomas Hart Benton. He gained recognition both nationally and regionally. Benton's initial style drew influence from Parisian modernism before the First World War. At the end of the war, like many Americans, Benton focused on Benton focused his work inward on an American style. In 1926, his signature cartoon-like style with roots in abstraction emerged right alongside his commitment to develop a purely American art. His subject matter was that of everyday Americans, their dreams, aspirations, and who worked to make America a great nation. Art historian Marianne Berardi writes of Benton's style, quote, Throughout his career, Benton's work was based not on directly imitating or transcribing reality, but on creating a golden mean between the actual world and an ideal scheme of visual order and visual rhythm, end quote. Benton wrote of his own style, quote, if subject matter determined form and the subject matter was distinctively American, then an American form, no matter what the source of technical means, would eventually ensue, end quote. Thomas Hart Benton grew up in Neosho, Missouri, and held an interest in creating art from the start of his life. Born into a family of politicians in 1889, Benton was named after his great uncle, who was a U.S. Senator for the state of Missouri. His father was a lawyer and an elected congressman. After his father's election, Benton had access to the newly built Library of Congress, of which he spent many hours in as a young boy admiring the murals that would later become inspiration for him to work on a grand scale and create murals of his own. As a child, it was noted that he would draw and create images on any flat surface he could find, even his mother's wallpapered walls along the staircase. Benton's first professional work as an artist started when he was just 16 while spending time at a local bar in Joplin, Missouri. He was teased by the local drunks, for staring at a painting of a nude woman that hung in the bar. Benton quickly declared that he was an artist and was admiring the technique used to complete the painting rather than the naked woman portrayed. The local drunks challenged him, stating that if he were truly an artist, he should head across the street to the local newspaper office and apply for the open cartoonist position. Benton did just that. The editor asked Benton to sketch the likeness of a local shopkeeper which he obliged to and shortly thereafter was offered the position on the spot. 
While Benton received support for his drive to become an artist from his mother, his father was not keen to the idea, wanting him to follow the family legacy as a lawyer or politician. Unhappy with Benton taking a position as a cartoonist with the local paper, his father shipped him off to military school in Upper Alton, Illinois. After only one term, he gave up on trying to change Benton's career path and sent him to the Art Institute of Chicago. Benton had the aspirations of becoming a good cartoonist, but was introduced to a medium that would change his projection as an artist, oil paint. Benton wrote of his introduction to oil paint, quote, I have never forgotten the nervous excitement that enveloped me when I began squeezing out the colors. Why this mechanical act should have occasioned the emotional rocking it did is hardly explainable. From the moment I first stuck my brush in a fat gob of color, I gave up the idea of newspaper cartooning. I made up my mind that I would become a painter." End quote. In 1908, Benton headed to Paris to study art, and here his style profoundly shifted towards modernism. Upon arriving in Paris, he quickly learned that modernism had begun to shift from narrative and realism type paintings towards abstraction and introspection. Benton was wary to try this new style, but quickly began to adapt to it and experiment with different styles like pointillism, impressionism, and post-impressionism with imitations of Cezanne, one of his largest influences. As Benton explored these new modernist styles, he became friends with fellow American artist Stanton MacDonald Wright, and the two pushed one another to grow within these styles. After returning from Paris, Benton faced challenges as he tried to get his painting career up off the ground. After making it to New York, he still faced struggles in becoming successful until MacDonald Wright returned to the US and the two picked up where they left off in pushing one another to expand as an artist. MacDonald Wright had developed a new modernist style after Benton left Paris, known as synchromism a style rooted in inspiration from cubism with fractured shapes, but using rainbow colors instead of muted palettes as cubists did. Benton was intrigued by this style and began creating synchromist work. During World War I, Benton served in the Navy doing venial tasks until it was discovered that he was an artist. Benton was removed from these tasks and was instead directed to create a highly accurate and detailed drawings of the Navy activity in Norfolk, forcing Benton out of abstraction and back towards realistic portrayals in a modernist manner. Benton was a skilled drafter and he would finish his Navy assignments rather early in the day, leaving him to create his own work. He created many watercolors during this time period, inspired to be drawing people and objects from life again. Benton wrote of this shift, quote, this was the most important thing that so far I had ever done for myself as an artist. My interests became in a flash of an objective nature. The mechanical contrivances of buildings, the new airplanes, the blimps, the dredges, the ships of the base, because they were so interesting in themselves, tore me away from all of my grooved habits, from my play with colored cubes and classic attentions, from my aesthetic dribblings and morbid self-concerns. I left for good art for art's sake world in which I had to hitherto, I left for good art for art's sake world in which I had hitherto lived, end quote. It was when Benton's father passed that he began to turn inward towards American subjects and representations and stepped away from the individualism and abstraction of modernism. In 1924, Benton headed back to Missouri to visit his sick father and was, and was struck with inspiration to reclaim his Midwestern roots. He wrote of his return to Missouri, quote, I cannot honestly say what happened to me while I was watching my father die and I listened to the voices of his friends. But I know that when after his death, I went back East I was moved by a great desire to know more of the American, which I had glimpsed in the suggestive words of his old cronies, who, seeing him at the end of his tether, had tried to jerk him back with reminiscent talk and suggestive anecdote. I was moved by a desire to pick up again the threads of my childhood." End quote. After his father's death, Benton focused solely on Midwestern scenes. He made several sketching trips across the country, collecting material to create paintings with. 
With these sketches, Benton was able to have an array of ideas at his hands to use for the murals he would soon be creating. Between 1930 and 1935, Benton created some of his most important and well-known murals, including America Today, 1930, and A Social History of Missouri, painted in 1935. Straying from traditional modernism and focusing on Midwestern scenes removed and isolated Benton from the New York art scene until regionalism was identified as an art movement in 1934. Benton wrote, quote, the careers of abstract artists often end in a kind of bitter emptiness. It's the emptiness of a person looking into himself all the time, but the objective world is always rich. There's always something around the next bend of the river, end quote. In 1926, Benton was introduced to John Stuart Curry in, at an architectural elite exhibition in New York where Benton had work on display. Benton at the time was exhibiting one of the panels from his America Today mural. The panel was not well received by other artists or critics, but Curry disagreed. Curry expressed his approval of the work to Benton and the two became friends. Curry and Benton alike recognized that artists were attempting to create work reminiscent of the modern art coming out of the Paris schools. They were both discontented with the oversaturation of European modernism across American art and agreed that American art needed to be about the American experience in order to designate itself from and be successful in comparison to European art. While the two did not outright reject the Paris School, they were against American artists imitating these styles instead of creating their own. They became impressed with the modern art rising out of New Mexico around the time of the Taos Society of Artists. Noticing how these artists were focusing on a purely American subject matter. Benton described Curry as a slow and clumsy talker taking several months for him to get to really know Curry and understand what he was thinking. A close friend of Curry's, Don Anderson, described what getting to know Curry was like. Quote, it was not easy to become friends with John Curry. A gentle and soft-spoken man, he would not seek favor or acceptance in dishonest agreement of opinion, even little polite white lies. Easy conversation was not his forte and even friendly talks with him tended to become two-sided monologues rather than dialogue. But once contact was established, there was no more delightful a man to be with, end quote. Benson also noted how deeply Curry was affected by the viewer's response to his work and had an inclination for self-doubt. Curry wrote of the role the viewer plays in his work as, quote, the artist is nothing in himself. He becomes something only as the world finds meaning in his creation. End quote. Curry's roots give insight to his interest in American subject matter and the Midwest. Born on a farm in Donovan, Kansas in 1897, Curry wrote firsthand of his childhood. Quote, I was raised on hard work. We were up at four o'clock the year round, feeding the cattle, planting and plowing corn, cutting hay and wheat, and in the school month and in the school months doing a half day's work before we rode to town on horseback to our lessons. But we didn't mind. It was the only life we knew, and I had a strong constitution. End quote. Outside of his farming duties, Young Curry held an interest in art from the beginning, sketching farming animals, sketching farm animals, steam engines, copying newspaper illustrations, anything he could get his hands on. At the age of 12, Curry's mother signed him up for art lessons during the summer. Here he learned to draw with charcoal and paint with watercolor. Despite being from a farming family, he received exceptional support from his parents when he decided to leave high school at the end of his junior year to attend the Kansas City Art Institute. Curry would be at the Kansas City Art Institute for only one month before leaving for the Art Institute of Chicago finding the Kansas City Art Institute too sophisticated for him. He apparently did not find the Art Institute of Chicago too sophisticated as he spent two years attending the school and working odd jobs to support himself. By 1919, Curry had begun to dabble in illustration and studied under the American painter Harvey Dunn. Curry had a successful but brief career in illustration, creating works for publications like Boy's Life and the Saturday Evening Post. In 
but by 1925, his success began to dwindle. He no longer wanted to bend to commercial requests and began to receive criticism that his illustrations looked too much like paintings, and so Curry would abandon illustration by the end of 1925 and pursue a career as an artist. Curry's career as an artist did not take off as quickly. His early paintings were not well received by critics, but this did not deter Curry. In 1926, he borrowed $1,500 so he could head to Paris for, five, for eight months with his wife to study drawing. After returning to the U.S., he completed his first major painting, Baptism in Kansas, painted in 1928. Unfortunately, this work is under copyright and we're unable to show it, but I would highly suggest looking it up on your own time. This work depicts a real life scene that Curry observed in 1915 in the religious community he grew up in. At the time, the creeks were dry and a livestock water tank had to be used to perform the baptism. Baptism, baptism in Kansas was first exhibited the year it was completed in 1928 and was praised by critics for its divergence from the American modernism that abstracted landscapes and urban scenes. Curry's spotlight on rural America was a breath of fresh air and signaled the emergence of regionalism. After this successful exhibition, Curry received positive attention from the art world. Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, founder of the Whitney Museum of American Art in New York, offered Curry a monthly stipend of $200 a month for one year so that he could pursue painting full time. During that year, Curry completed some of the most important works of his career. In January of 1930, Curry had his first solo exhibition that resulted in several of his works being purchased by both the Whitney Museum of American Art and the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Curry's work would be widely well received by the public and critics alike, leading to many commissions, including murals commissioned by the Federal Arts Program in 1935 for the US Department of Justice building in DC. The following year, he would be appointed as artist in residence at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. While he was not required to do anything but paint and create work, Curry took it upon himself to offer mentorship, mentorship to the students. Upon accepting his residency from the University of Wisconsin, Madison, Curry commented to students about the meaning of schools of art in relation to the artists as, quote, I learned that I belonged to the regional school of art long after I had done the work as I pleased without giving a thought as to what school it might fit into. There's a great deal of nonsense in the critics' attempts to classify artists and their work." End quote. Curry compared, Curry compared to his contemporaries was not interested in sticking to one distinct painting style. And his ideal viewer was someone from Kansas or familiar with farming life in the Midwest. He never forgot his Kansas roots. He took an austere approach in his style that captivated critics, but as interest in regionalism began to fluctuate and modernist art that focused on formal style and innovation became more popular, Curry's skill and technique was questioned. However, the public did not critique his work as professionals did and continued to enjoy the scope and power his work emulated. While Curry continued to grow and master his technique, his subject matter never changed. He captured the character and experience of the Midwest before and during the Depression more than any of his contemporaries. Curry wrote of his Midwestern subjects, I quote, I believe in subject matter. The artist ought to paint people doing things. The use of life is an excuse for clever arrangements of color or other pictorial elements where it begins, end quote. Curry unfortunately passed of a heart attack at the age of 49 after his health began to deteriorate. This was four years after the death of Grant Wood. The death of these two artists led to the end of regionalism being popular as modernism and abstract expressionism began to take hold of the public's interests. American regionalism had a short-lived but exuberant period of popularity in the 1920s and mid-1930s and was able to succeed because of the time period that it emerged. At the end of World War I, Americans were turning inward and what better represented the hardworking American than views of the Midwest. Thomas Hart Benton and John Stuart Curry were both extremely familiar with the Midwest 
and were able to portray it in such a way that their work became symbols for a purely American art. Thank you so much for joining us this evening for AMWA After Hours for this discussion on regionalism.